Okay, we are now live. Okay, I think it's about time. So uh, welcome everybody. Hi to the last VMAX talk of this year. Uh, just um, for, for your information, we will resume in, in March. And until then, it's, it's happy holidays and uh, a long job market season that everybody hopefully will have the best of times. And today, our last speaker is going to be Frank Portier from UCL. And he will talk about monetary policy. Um, so no COVID papers anymore. So because he's alone, um, he will stop in between to, to ask you for clarification questions, but you can also post all your questions in the Q&A window, and then we discuss it in the last 15 minutes. Yeah? But clarification questions potentially also in between, but just post them and then I will stop him. Okay, please, Frank. Thanks, uh, Ralph. Thanks uh, to all of you for being here and thanks for inviting me. It's a joint work with um, Paul Vaudry and, and uh, Seb Wu. Paul is currently giving a talk, so he cannot, he cannot be here. And Sev is having an interview. Um, he's on the job market this year, so he cannot be here either. So I'm, I am by myself. I hope there was nothing strategic in their decision not to, not to attend this, this, uh, this seminar. Uh, as Ralph said, that's the last um, talk of the season. So I really want to thank you know, uh, warmly you know, my name. That's the only thing I can do, but I'm showing the name of all others that have attended all those great uh, VMAX sessions. So let me thank Stefania, Ralph, Kurt, Laura, Morton, and Claudia. This is, guys, this is just like a great thing. I'm a great fan. And another another thing I want to say is that Sev, you know, one of the three quarters is, as I said, is on the market this year. It's great. Uh, make sure that you make a screen copy of this slide and that you, you know, you check that you have invited him for, for, um, for an interview. Okay, so this is what we do. Uh, so we, we really started. We really started from uh, from the you know the the, the the U.S. and elsewhere situation just before the uh, the COVID nineteen, which was a situation with low unemployment on the one side and low inflation, which was you know puzzling as seen from the through the lens of a new Keynesian model, and that uh, situation is just like one out of many puzzles of the. New Keynesian models as far as inflation is concerned. And I could like list you know, missing deflation in the Great Recession, missing volatility of inflation at the ZLB, price puzzle almost all the time, missing inflation today, given you know uh, big supply shock and lax monetary policy. Uh, so what we propose to do in this paper is to revive an old idea, the question of monetary policy, nothing spectacular here, and show that it can solve some of those puzzles and at the same time be empirically relevant. So let me be very clear, uh, try to be very clear about what we do. Um, so we're gonna do three things. First, we're gonna do theory in a super standard three equation model in which the Phillips curve will be of this, this form like the typical new cage of Phillips curve. Inflation will depend on expected inflation and marginal cost. So that inflation is you know, discounted some of future marginal cost. And uh, you know, marginal cost will depend on this guy output gap, which is, which is therefore, to basically uh, proxy for um, labor market uh, tightness. And we just add this extra term, which is the fact that marginal cost might also depend on the financial, you know, on, 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 on the interest rate because firms also have, are making financial decisions that Im impact their, mar their marginal cost. So that's you know, nothing new here. I'll explain how we, how we derive that, but it's really you know, nothing, nothing really deep or interesting. So what? So when we work, you know, the theory, we find actually that there is an interesting, like, a, you know, a part of the parameter set in which interesting results can uh, can be obtained. And this this you know part of the of the parameter set that is interesting is, is the one in which gamma y, which I will refer to as the slope of the Phillips curve, when the, this gamma y is small compared to this gamma r. Okay, so case where the the Phillips curve is relatively slow, uh, is, is relatively flat as far as labor market tightness is concerned, but the the, the cost channel, the, the interest rate enters in a way which is not negligible into the marginal cost of firms. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to explain, you know, why interesting things can happen in this case and why this uh, makes us rethinking part of what we think we know about about monetary policy. Uh, but then the question will be, you know, okay, fine, but is that is that empirically relevant or is it just a curiosity, you know, uh, without much uh, interest, practical interest? So then the two other parts of that presentation will be, and of the paper, are about 
you know, convincing you that this is indeed relevant, relevant using, using macro data. So what we macro, what we do first is that we try to carefully estimate just a Phillips curve. So there's a huge literature on that. We're trying to do our best to follow, you know, what people are doing. So, so, that, so that's what we do. So, and then what we find systematically, and I think in a pretty convincing way is that the Phillips curve is flat, meaning that this gamma Y is, is very close to zero. And that guy, the gamma R is always there and significant and positive. So this puts us in, uh, you know, this configuration that we believe is, is kind of relevant. So some people don't like that because of course here you have like, you know, the issue of, 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 of the instrument you choose to identify uh, you know, the parameters is, is you know, it's, it's a difficult issue. So what the other way to, to go around with this is to, use, is to use a full model in order to get identification. Of course, you know, if you don't like the model then you won't, you won't like the results, but you know, we, leave, we, we leave you like the, the choice of choosing between those two approaches. And the th second approach is to estimate a full, by full information, uh, a three equation Newcanian model, like a relatively simple one. And I'll explain you know, uh, what we do uh, with the same Phillips curve. And again, we're gonna find that, uh, that obviously this, 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 will, this will have to happen at, uh, just now. Okay, and uh, excuse me, let me, let me say that again. In one hour. <laughs> okay. And what, is, what do we find? Again, film curve is flat, and this guy here is positive and significant. That's what we do. Uh, perhaps I can pose in case there are any clarification questions at this stage. Ralph, you tell me. All good, I guess. Go ahead. Okay, good. So so all those three things, the theory, and it's you know it's gonna be like you'll see, simple, then you know, film scale estimation, then full information estimation. Let me start with the theory. So, okay, and here, I guess it's in contrast with much of the papers that, has been, that have been presented at the VMAX, so I don't want to spend time on my propositions, not because they are known, but because they are like, I mean, obvious. Uh, I mean, they're not deep. So we're gonna have like uh, a typical new Cajun model in which, you know, at, uh, only uh, one single good which is produced with, 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 with labor so that, uh, Y will be at the same time consumption and output. And here everything is, is in deviation from the uh, flex price allocations. And so we'll have a first equation that tells me that you know, demand today is demand tomorrow uh, minus the function of the interest rate. That's a Euler equation. And then I have my, my Phillips curve uh, I, I told you before that you derive you know, using a Calvo story. Okay, so how do we, so, the, so here, how do we, introduce you know, financial cost to, into the marginal cost of firms. That's a model without capital. So you, we need to be a little bit creative, but people have done that in the past. So the idea is that we're going to assume, uh, so what people do in general, general is that they assume that firms have to borrow the wage bill before producing. And then you know the financial cost from, comes from the fact that uh, the, the, the labor cost is the wage plus the, the, the interest rate. So this particular choice is putting you know, very specific, very specific restrictions on the value of this gamma y and this gamma r that we don't have. We want to have like you know full uh, to span the full possible values of the two. So we have a little bit of a different story in which there's a round a range of intermediate goods and then firms you know are producing intermediate goods and then you know producing final goods with intermediate goods and those intermediate goods you have to pay them in advance and pay financial cost in, uh, in order to 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 use them as, as inputs. So what it does it it, it, it only makes us makes the model possible to have any arbitrary values from gamma y and gamma r uh, as long as they are both positive, okay? So nothing, nothing deep here. So there's another thing that we also do that I perhaps I would have preferred not to tell you about because it's gonna be a bit confusing, but you know, I'm not supposed to lie. So there's also, uh, we also have like a sorry for having this contiguous equations here. And we're gonna, we're gonna assume that households cannot always commit to repay and therefore there's a kind of risk premium on, uh, that depends on the amount of debt that they, that, 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 that they subscribe, that they issue, and that will make, you know, that will, that will create an alpha y smaller than one here. So, you know, you know, this has been like developed by many people, but you know, for what we do, this alpha y can be arbitrarily close to one. So this is why it's, it's, it's really not so important. I'll tell you, where is it that it's, it's important? It's important because of the particular way we're gonna model much, much policy. But that, so if you want to think that it's one, you know, nothing will, nothing will change, you know, in a, in a deep way. 
So that's that's the that's that's the one. So what I'm going to do now is just define intuitively a condition on parameters that is simple to interpret and that will happen to be key and not studied before. Let me denote R the real, the real interest rate. So I'm going to rewrite those two first equations as a function of the real interest rate here. So here in, in demand and here in uh, the marginal cost. And let me do this mental experiment. Let me assume that most authorities increase the real interest rate by 1%. And I'm going to, my question is, what has happened? What's the impact of inflation? Keeping expectations fixed. Well, why am I doing that? Because then it's easy to understand what is going on. And then, of course, I will relax that. But, you know, let's assume that in, in expectations are fixed and that there is an increase in the real interest rate of 1%. So the traditional effect that we have in new Cajun models is that increasing the real interest rate is discouraging demand. Discouraging demand is reducing the tightness of the labor market and therefore reducing the marginal cost. And therefore, we're likely to have um, a drop in inflation. So, that's the what we call the indirect effect of inflation that goes through the demand channel, and it's equal to this minus alpha r times gamma y. But there's also a direct effect, which is that you know the interest the interest rate is directly entering the marginal cost of the firms uh, here. So once there's an increase in the interest rate, there's an increase in the marginal cost, and this increase in the marginal cost is passed to the pri to prices, and therefore inflation goes up. So the direct effect of uh, uh, tight, tightening monetary policy on inflation is positive and is equal to this gamma r. So now you see that there is a condition that we're going to call the Patman condition that tells us that an increase in r, keeping expe expectation fixed, will indeed increase inflation or decrease inflation if this condition holds. This condition being just that the cost channel is large enough compared to, you know, like the, this product. And you know, for those who know a little bit about you know, how the world is. We know that this alpha R is like typically very small. We know that this gamma Y, which is the slope of the Phillips curve is also pretty small. So that, that wouldn't be surprising that once we do things properly, we find that this condition is likely to hold, at least locally. So why Patman? So in the 70s, there you know, have been a debate and you know, some, some, some people were criticizing the, the Fed for uh, having very high um, uh, interest rate policy. And that was actually the cause of inflation and not, uh, and it was not fighting inflation. And Congressman Patman, when one was the guy that was basically pushing this idea that the Fed was throwing gasoline on fire by uh, by, by increasing interest rates to, to 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 lower inflation because the effect would be on the on the contrary to increase inflation. So we call it Patman for that reason. And Valerie Remy has, has you know discussed that in a, in a new paper. Uh, okay, so if you don't like this idea of keeping expectations fixed, just you know assume that all shocks are ID. Okay. If all shocks are ID, all, no, this is a model without state variables, so then all the expected terms would be zero. So indeed, expectations are fixed in equilibrium, and therefore, if we increase R, uh, and then therefore this condition is indeed the, the GE condition. And it's also a case where you, uh, no, that's, that's all I want to say at this stage. Okay, so, uh, so we believe that, of course, this condition cannot be a global condition. So this idea that even if the economy, you know, much worse because it's like super lax, so that there's like a super uh, negative uh, output gap. The idea that even in that case, there won't be inflation, that, that, that would be a bit crazy. So we really believe that, you know, let's assume that marginal cost is linear in the real interest rate, but it's very likely that it's going to be, you know, non-linear in the output gap and close to the steady state, you know, the, the, you know, the slope will be kind of minimum. That's the marginal cost that's the part of the marginal cost that is related to labor market. And the idea is that that's, that's uh, the output gap. Close to the steady state, you know, that slope is by gamma y is small, but it's very likely that you know, if you go further away, it's gonna be large, okay? Because at some point, you know, this utility of labor, the decreasing returns will, will kick in and, and scarcity of resources. So, so that pattern condition, we have to think of it as a local condition, but the question is how local, okay? Does it, and does it hold on average? So that's what the empirical work will tell us. And we we'll, most of the time use a linear approximation and we'll see that in the linear approximation, you know, indeed it, it holds, uh, yeah, it holds. And then I'll do some nonlinear stuff at some point. Okay, so, so in the literature on the cost channel for models that you can solve more or less analytically in three equation type models, as I said, the model specification makes it impossible for the Patman condition to hold. So that's not the case that has been studied. No, there have been models with the cost channel, but not with this condition, you know, 
holding. And you see that you know when this condition holds, a lot of things are upside down. Okay. Um, another thing which is important, if you think of demand shocks and markup shocks, you won't see any difference between an economy in the Patman zone or not in the Patman zone. So that's no, that's not very important. I mean, so it's really important only when you look when one look at monetary policy, monthly monetary policy rules and monetary policy shocks. Uh, okay. So yeah. Um, so there's a lot of results, you know, that theoretical results that we derive in the paper that are kind of interesting and a bit puzzling, but let me give you only three. Uh, how to stabilize inflation, what have, you know, this idea that there's likely to be a ZLV trap and the price pattern. So uh, yeah, there are more in the paper and uh, all what we do, I should say, is only, you know, uh, positive. We're not doing any normative analysis. So we're kind of like pretending that the central bank would like to basically bring inflation you know, uh, back to target when there's a shock. We're not, we're not, we're not claiming that this is the optimal thing to do. Um, okay, so here is what we're going to do. Let's take the the Euro equation of the Phillips curve, and let me assume that there's a shock to demand or a markup shock, okay, and uh, which is positive. And let me assume that monetary policy is simply to increase the real interest rate from zero, which is like the steady state, to R. And keep it constant for capital n period. And you can choose capital n you know, the way you want, and then return to zero. Why we do that? Because then we can compute analytically everything. Okay. So it's a once for all surprising shock. And so I'm going to derive the, the equilibrium relation between inflation and the interest rate. And I'm going to just plot this relation. So, and here I'm keeping you know, the, this linearity here. I'm not going to use it much, but you, know, you, you will see why I use it. But if you want to think that we're in a case where, you know, everything is in R, it's fine except for one result. But in in my you know, but in my graph, I will keep you know the, those two equations as being you know, non linear, but it's not like super important except in one in one uh, in, in one case. Okay, so that's that's the typical equilibrium relation between inflation and the real interest rate. So that's that's the steady state. If you know if if the central bank is increasing the real interest rate, this is this is going to decrease inflation. Okay, that's what we know. So now let's assume that, oops, sorry, that there's a demand shock, let's say a demand shock, positive demand shock. So absent of any reaction of monetary policy, we would observe, we would observe an increase in inflation. And then the central bank that would like to uh, bring inflation back to target, will have to increase the interest rate, right? That's, that's what we know. That's the way to deal with uh, demand shocks, uh, positive demand shock in, in this kind of model. Uh, okay, so now, let me be in the case where the Patman condition is is is, uh, is is indeed met. So when the Patman condition is met, you know, this curve is as actually the opposite uh, uh, the, the opposite slope, the slope at the opposite side. Sorry. Okay. So this is what I said before when I said you know when when there is an increase in R, an increase in R is causing an increase in inflation, not a decrease in inflation. Why? Because the direct effect on the marginal cost is stronger than the indirect effect that goes from the from you know, discouraging demand and, and then reduction of the output gap and therefore reduction in inflation. So now, once you have again a demand shock, you know, the traditional uh, policy advice, which is, oh, when inflation moves uh, above target, then one should increase the inflation in order to bring it back to target. That's going to be that's going to have the complete opposite effect. Okay, that will move the inflation even further away from target. And we'll see when I talk about the ZLB. That's it seems that this is exactly what, what, what we have observed, you know, the other way around for a negative dimension. Uh, so just one word about, you know, the global thing. So you see that here I have this, I have a local, that, that's a local result, but, you know, as I said, if we go, if we go far away, uh, you know, uh, uh, far, far enough away from the steady state, then it's likely that, you know, this relation will become again, again like this. So we have like the typical, you know, Keynesian, I mean, Keynesian, I don't know how we should call it, the typical traditional zone here, right? So we're not saying that, of course, you know, if, 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 the, if the, the output gets super low, super high, then there is again a slope with Phillips curve. And then in that case, you know, when there is a demand shock, then you know the interesting the interesting policy advice is that, and again, it's maybe I should have done like a negative dimension because it would have been more relevant for the current situation. So the idea is that, well, if you you know if you're not playing big. You'd rather stay home because if you cannot like try to bring back inflation on target by increasing a little bit the interest rate, you're gonna go the opposite direction. So you need to really play big 
in order to uh, you know put yourself in a zone where indeed you you're, you're, you're bringing inflation closer to target compared to what happens at the shop. Okay, uh, so let me tell you about the headed trap. So we do that in the paper more in, 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 and other things in a in a, in a uh, um, uh, I mean, we, we do it fully, you know, not only with words, uh, algebraic, algebraic, sorry, but here, here's the story. So, uh, when you have the patent condition, imagine that you have an initial, you know, discount factor shock, so that there's an initial, you know, uh, negative dimension. So that's going to create an impact, low inflation and low activity. So if the, if monetary policy reacts, if, if the monetary authorities react by monetary expansions as the new Keynesian model suggests, then you know there would be a lowering of the of the interest rate. And then if we're in the Padman zone, not an increase in inflation, but uh, a further decrease in inflation, that will call for even more monetary expansions, that will call for even lower I. And then at some point, you know, the economy will be basically stuck into the to the to the ZLV trap. And this kind of mechanism you can formally show that for example, if one follows the press event targeting, that's exactly where you know, you're, gonna, you're gonna end uh, following uh, uh, a relatively large um, dimension. Okay, so price puzzle, another thing that, that's obvious, you know, obviously uh, when, when you're under Fatman, uh, an increase in the, in, in the range of is increasing inflation, that's just, just the, very, the very way it is defined. So what we can show more interesting is that you know, in a model in which you have more endogenous propagation, that's, you don't have permanently a price puzzle, but you have a price puzzle in the short run, which looks very much at what we see in the data. Okay, that, that, that's all for, you know, we have other things in the paper, but, but let, me, let me stop here for, for, the, um, for the theory. Uh, Ralph, any, any questions at this stage? Yeah, I think we can wait with this question until afterwards for the Q&A. Okay, very good. Thank you. So let me move to, to, to part two and three, which are about estimation. So in here, uh, we're not trying, so in, I'm not sure that we were, we were trying to be smart in the first part or that we succeeded in this part, but here we're not trying to be smart at all. So we're not trying to do the best possible thing given the, you know, given the literature. So we've been on this large literature that estimates, you know, single equation Phillips curve. Not everyone likes it. I think it's, you know, as always, I mean, there are pros and cons. Uh, anyway. Okay, so this is what we want to estimate in the simple case. That's that, uh, that equation, you know, so we need to, to observe inflation, the output gap, the interest rate, maybe some controls and this market shock. So, so first we need to have like a measure of uh, a proxy for the output gap. That's one thing, so it's gonna be X, the proxy for the output gap, and then we're gonna, not gonna be fancy here. Then we need to have to measure, to observe, uh, you know, X, 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 um, Ex expected inflation. So either we will okay. So we need either to look at you know expectation uh, in, expect, uh, inflation expectations in surveys or assume you know rational expectations and use realized in, uh, realized inflation. And then uh, yeah, that's that's the, the two difficult things to do. So in the baseline model, we're going to use you know, headline CPI. Why? Because then we can use the Michigan Survey of Consumers for expected inflation. And for X, we're going to use minus the unemployment gap from the US uh, CBO. One, and yeah, and then uh, and we're going to always control for all prices. So we do a lot, lot, lot of robustness with respect to samples and you know measures of inflation and measures of the output gap. Uh, I'm not going to really uh, present all of this here because it's you know, I think it's important to do it. Results are robust, but it's a bit boring to, to, to see in a, in, a, in a short seminar, but I'm, I'm, I'll show you some, some of this stuff. Okay, so then the big, big problem is endogeneity, of course, because what, what we would like to do is that we would like to, to, to look at uh, yeah, movement along this equation that would be caused by you know, something happening elsewhere than this, in this equation. So we need to deal for sure with the endogeneity of the output gap or the measure of the output gap, plus possibly measurement error, of course, we need to deal with the endogeneity of inflation expectations. And you know, what we don't have to do in general when you don't have this cost channel, also the endogeneity of the, of the policy rate. Okay, so we're gonna do that in the, in the best possible way. So let me, let me try to show you like the very basic equation, but I think everything, is, you know, most of the results are conveyed in those three. There will be like four um, estimations here. So, uh, um, 
So, sorry. Yeah, so the basic, the, you know, basic equation is with the Michigan survey of consumer, okay? A, a measure of uh, inflation expectation. So what the literature is doing most of the time is that considering that then you don't need to instrument the, the uh, inflation expectations because they come from, from survey, from surveys. I'm not sure I, I fully understand, but you know, let me do it like that, then I will instrument for everything. But that's really what is done in the literature. Uh, so let me do first, you know, not put the cost channel and then do OLS. So I find that there is you no, know, indeed, the Phillips curve is sloppy, it's significant, and you know, the beta is whatever it is. So sample is 69 to 2017. Uh, so now what, what, what people do is that, you know, they acknowledge that uh, the output gap is mismeasured and also endogenous. So basically what people you know, very simply do is they're just instrument with the lags and the output gap. And if you do that, well, you still find that the, the slope of the Phillips curve is significantly positive. Now let me simply introduce, I mean simply, let me introduce the, re, the real interest rate on top of uh, the, the, uh, the output gap. And let me here instrument the, this rate. And here for, for you know, to instrument like the policy measure, we, we do what uh, Quabon and, um, uh, uh, I forgot the name of the, uh, not Quabon, um, um, oh my God. Okay, come back to me. Um, Barnichon and Mester are doing, sorry. So, which is a uh, very good idea is to use basically the, the Romer and Romer uh, 2004 shocks and their squares in order to instrument for, for the, the, the pulse rate. So if you do that, well, what do you find? Questionnaire is like very significant and, and, posit and very, it's positive and significant. And then, you know, the Phillips curve becomes, becomes flat. Okay. Uh, then, you know, let me do like the last thing. So those are very simple things. Let me instrument both the uh, the output gap and the um, policy rate, and again, you know, you find the same result. So that reason I want you know keep it in mind because we, that, that's exactly what we're going to find you know consistently all the time using the Phillips curve only using the whole model. Basically, gamma y is, is zero, if not negative, but never significant, and this gamma r is always uh, you know is always uh, positive and significant. So that's you know in a nutshell that's result. So let's also instrument for the for the for the um, uh, for inflation expectations. So if you do that, then you know. So here we also instrument for inflation expectations, and we, for that we use two lags of inflation. And again, you do find um, you know, same result. Phillips curve is flat. Question is there, and and you see that uh, you know unless if you remember the the Patman condition, there was also the elasticity of consumption to, to the real interest rate. So unless this guy is like super large, it would need to be something like you know fifty in order for the Patman condition not to work. Because you need to multiply this, you know, this multiplied by uh, this alpha R, which is one if you are log, needs to be greater than this guy here, okay? So we need something like uh, 50, yes, exactly. Okay, uh, now let's, let's assume that indeed we have our expectations. expectation, so let's, let's replace this guy here by realized inflation and estimate, you know, again, you know, uh, uh, instrumenting everything, you again find that uh, we all have significance of 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 the um, of the output gap, but the the, the, the rate is the gamma are significant. The, the question is there. Uh, so, it's a super, you know, it's like a very very simple uh, Phillips curve. The least you can do is just add a little bit of you know, some persistence and have this kind of hybrid hybrid Phillips curve. You get you get the similar very similar results. Okay. I'm not going to show you here. So one thing more interesting is they say, oh, but you know, so we did many, many samples, but you know, perhaps this is really due to the fact that we know that the Phillips curve has flattened quite a lot, but maybe, maybe if we go back to, you know, the glorious time of the Phillips curve, like 69 to 92, then we should see, we should see it. And indeed, you know, so I'm estimating the same equation again, but now 69 to 92, if I do, if I don't put the real interest rate, yes, you know, I have a much steeper Phillips curve. But as, as, as soon as I introduce the, the, the real interest rate, again, the, 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 so the output gap disappears and what you, what you keep is only the, uh, the real interest rate. So that seems to be a result which is, which is kind of like consistently there in the, uh, over, over the whole sample. So that's, I mean, this is, I'm not sure what it means, but so now you can, you know, you can make all the possible combinations of measures of inflation, measures of the output gap, sample, and this and that, and then you end up with 1984 estimates, and uh, and what? So you want to look at 
So what do you want to see? So you want to see that most of the time, you know, you are close to gamma. That's gamma L should be a gamma Y, I'm sorry. Most of the time you're close to this, this guy being zero. Uh, and you know, the dark ones are, are the ones in which at least one coefficient is significant. And you see that there are, most of the time you're in the dark here. You, you have a dark dot and that dark dot is in the gray zone and the gray zone is the, when the Pattman condition is satisfied when the um, when the interest rate elasticity is is point one, so of course you know if you make it like a bit larger, I mean, I mean it's going to change. But the idea is that you know it's a it's a kind of very robust thing. It's a very robust result. So let me say a word about. I said you know this is likely to be local. It cannot be all the time. So how local? So for that, let me do something which is that's the nice thing of doing you know when you when you estimate only one equation, you know it's easy to do that, to to be non linear on the on the right hand side, right? Uh, so let me let me put like the square and the, and the cube of the output gap here in order to get you know, this kind of graph I showed you before. So let me estimate that and let me derive the equivalent of the pi of r condition, which is you know inflation keeping constant expectations as a function of the interest rate. And so what do you see here? Well, you see that there is indeed a, a big zone where in which I mean there's a zone, not a big zone. There's a zone in which this. Uh, relation is indeed upward sloping. That's the Pac-Man zone. And I told you, you know, if you remove the nonlinear terms, it's always upward sloping. Okay, on average, it's upward sloping. And two, you see that the zone over which it's upward sloping is something like I don't know minus two to plus three uh, percentage points around the average real interest rate over the sample. So it's like most of the time. Okay, and that's you know, of course, you know. Now you know it's, it's only one equation. We have to instrument a lot of things, so it's all you know. It's a little bit like a, uh, it's not is that like very robust. So here I'm showing you what happens if you change a lot of things. Like you do, oops, you do survey. You use surveys of relaxed inflation, and you use the hybrid or non hybrid version of the pH curve. And you know the black one was the one I showed you before, and here are all the other ones. So you can have results where basically Patman is everywhere, which are a bit crazy, but you know, it's it's kind of it. We get the, this feeling that most of the time the, the economy is in this pattern. So, okay, so let me for you know, or perhaps yeah, no, let me say that. So you might you might tell me, okay, but you know, all those models with cost channel, it's the nominal interest rate, and not the real one that enters the uh, the, the field. So two answers to that. So from a theory point of view, it is whatever we want, right? We decide. So as as a model makers, what we did is that we first write a model in which with flex prices in which firms have to borrow. For, for, for any given reason, then we get you know, the, this thing. And then we add like sticky prices. So unless we add another financial friction, which is which would be that firms cannot have access to a real bonds, but only nominal bonds. There's a reason in particular to believe that it's the nominal that should enter. That's one, one answer. Uh, from the point of view of estimating the Phillips curve, you know, it doesn't matter. It would be the same coefficient, just a matter of interpretation. So if you want to get rid of this part here, you just have to you know, put inflation, expected inflation back here. So that, that's not going to change the, uh, the estimation of the gamma O and the gamma R. It's just going to change the estimation of what we believe is the discount factor. Okay. And so given, given our, our estimations, when we do it, when we do it with the real interest rate, you know, this discount factor is around 0.95, not significantly different from 0.99 using quarterly data, which is what people are generally thinking is a value that makes sense. When you do the nominal, then you get something which is like 0.95 minus 0.2, which is more like 0.75, which is a bit low for the beta. So we tend to think that, you know, this is, this is kind of like better fitting, I don't know, but I don't know better fitting what, better fitting the calibrated values that we, we most of the time believe in, in for, just for the beta. You know, but for the ratio of gamma y to gamma r, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't depend on, on this. You know, and all the results on the factors of the Phillips curve that are completely orthogonal to this, right? Because this comes after estimation. Well, in the in the fully structural model, of course, that would be would be more important. Okay, that's for the physical estimation. Ralph, I can pause if there are any um, uh, urgent questions at this stage. I would say you have like ten minutes, so just go through yeah. and discuss all the stuff. Oh, awesome. So last ten minutes, no, let me short. So now, now let me um, let me do the another way to identify you know, parameters, which is by estimating a fully structural model. And I'm gonna not I'm not gonna do like like super fancy thing or complicated thing. You know, there will be only orbital division. There will be no capital. So you know, we are still 
stesso way to go to be fully convincing about that, but that's it. That's what we do. Uh, so basic, um, you know, new kitchen model. This one is like fully forward looking. Now, of course, you know, shock will be, will have some persistence and are not IID. And then I'm having a, 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 a policy rule that I will specify, you know, very generally as the real interest rate is a function of the state of the economy. So we prove in the paper that, you know, allocations using this um, policy rules are encompassing the, the ones you would obtain with a Taylor rule. Okay, so there's no restriction at all doing that. But on the, on the contrary, estimating with the Taylor rule would restrict you know, the estimation of all the parameters. So we kind of like, uh, we strongly, so we're writing another paper on, on this, but we strongly advise you no know, model, uh, modelers to use this unless they believe that the central bank is effectively uh, is, uh, following a, a, Taylor, a Taylor rule so that it would be basically, it's a good restriction that we want to put on the data that they exactly do, uh, you know, this, this kind of like, uh, reaction to uh, output gap and, and inflation. Okay, uh, now, so we, we estimate this model, you, you, you cannot identify all the parameters. So we're not gonna identify beta and alpha y. I'm gonna assume that they are like 0.99, the two of them, you know, you can do all business to this, it's not like friend. Basically, you know, this this one here, basically, you know, the, 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 the identification is something like alpha y divided by alpha r equals something. So it's really, you know, it's one or the other. Uh, yeah, the beta y, um, it enters uh, in various places. But, okay, 0 0.99, 0 0.99, then we estimate it. We, so again, you know, baseline is headline, headline in a CPI inflation, minus unemployment gap and petrol rate. Uh, okay, we vary also the samples. And then we do here maximum likelihood estimation. So it works. And then you know, that's all the results that you can get depending on the, you know, the sample and the variables. Let me just look at that one. And I'm not showing all the all, all the parameters just for the sake of uh, of of, of, uh, of time. Uh, so what do you get? You get that the Phillips curve is flat. You see, so this is like the uh, standard deviation, and that you know this gamma r this um, uh, size of the cost channel is indeed uh, positive and significant. And if you look around, that, that's what you get all the time. You know, you can even get sometimes you know, non-significant but negative. Uh, sloping, uh, sloping the Phillips curve. So that's really something that that comes all the time. Um, so what does it mean if I look at the impulse responses of this model? So is that, is that model? You know, this model looks a bit crazy. So it's a model in which where you tighten when you tighten monetary policy, you 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 are actually uh, increasing inflation or decreasing inflation. Now perhaps this model is just giving us a completely ridiculous impulse responses. So let me look at the impulse responses to a dimension. Well, you know everything is like. Look, Pretty much what what we believe it should look like, uh, increase in, in 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 the output gap, uh, an increase in inflation, and the central bank is basically counteracting this by increasing the nominal interest rate in such a way that your interest rate increases. Uh, what's the markup shock? So that the markup shock is, is is almost exclusively uh, an inflation shock here. And then you have like then what you have the the uh, the monetary the monetary policy shock and the monetary policy shock monetary policy shock. It's a contractional monetary policy shock. So indeed, we see an increase in the real interest, uh, nominal interest rate, and a decrease in the output in the output gap. That's that's fine. But then we see this, or an increase in the output, or a decrease in the output gap. I don't know. An increase in the in the number. Uh, but we see that inflation compared to the new case is is, is, you know, is upside down. Inflation is increasing and decreasing. So that's the price puzzle. And of course, this has to be the case if the pattern condition is satisfied. So the pattern condition is a bit more complicated because you know the shocks are, are persistent, so you cannot keep in, uh, expectation constant. So you can derive like the proper pattern condition, but it holds. Okay. So then you what you can do is you do the hybrid uh, Phillips curve. So you add a little bit of uh, persistence everywhere. So you can microphone this by just assuming some a bit persistence. Then this you don't you don't micro you, know, you microphone you know you just assume that some 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 firms are the firms you know are not chosen by the Calvo ferry, but they can, you know, they can index their, 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 their price and inflation uh, on that inflation. And then you can assume that the central bank is not allowed, it's just exogenous to move too much, you know, the rate, the policy rate. And then if you do that, so now you cannot, you know, that maximum likelihood, you know, is not able to estimate anything. So you need to, to use Bayesian techniques. And so again, you know, you do various things, but this is typically what you get. Uh, the um, 
Fifth curve is not, the slope of fifth curve is not significant and negative at all. So that's not significant. And you get that, you know, this, this cost channel is always there, positive and significant. I, I didn't mention that before, but you know, in the Phillips curve, this gamma was about 0.2, you know, when I was estimating the Phillips curve. In, in the first model, it was about like 0.02. But, you know, this first model is really like a fully forward looking model, which is unlikely to fit well the data. So you see that here, depending on the sample, once you, you put some more um, uh, persistence and not just persistence, you know, you get gamma Rs, which are in your territory between 0.1 and 0.2, which is kind of like much closer to, to what we had in the, in the simple, um, in, the, in the one equation model. Okay, so that's, you know, for this model, that's the posterior distribution of the Patman condition. So Patman holds if it's positive, you see it's always positive. Because I don't, you know, I'm not showing this, but the alpha R, the elasticity of demand to the interest rate is, is like super small. It's really less than 0.1. Uh, and impulse responses, you know, they are a bit more, of course, a bit more persistent. But, you know, you do get the same result for, so again, I should have emphasized that. When you look at those two responses, you can't tell whether you're in the Pac-Man or not. And, you know, and this we show analytically. It's, everything is the same. Things are very different when you change either when you change monetary policy or when you look at the monetary policy. And again, monetary tightening is increasing nominal interest rate, decreasing, uh, decreasing, uh, decreasing, the, uh, decreasing the output or increasing unemployment, sorry, but is increasing inflation or decreasing inflation, price pattern again. Okay, to conclude, uh, cost channel, uh, the cost channel is strong as compared to the slope of the Phillips curve. Um, that's what we call the Patman condition. Um, we show that uh, we show that by estimating simple DSG-like models of Phillips curve alone, and we show also that it, this has um, implications for the effect of monetary policy uh, aiming at stabilizing at stabilizing inflation. I forgot to say, but perhaps you noticed that I had a dental surgery yesterday, so I'm also kind of struggling with uh, when I when I have to speak. So it's a very good day for me. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. I'm done. Thanks, Dan, for the great presentation. So there have been a couple of questions in the Q&A in the chat. So if you want to ask that question yourself, so please just raise your hand as a participant and then I will um, allow you to speak and unmute yourself. So Basil, you're the first ones. Uh, I allow you to talk. Please unmute yourself. Hello. I don't know if you guys hear me. Yeah. yeah. Hi, Basil. So Hi, hi, Frank. Great presentation. So let me just use this opportunity to thank all the VMAX team for like the great public good that they provide. So my question was the following. So, you know, I don't, I know you don't want to talk about micro foundation, but so what are the deep parameters that enter this gamma Y and this gamma R or even the, the, the full uh, nonlinear function of, uh, you know, the big gamma Y that you had? You know, is it like the share of intermediate input in your model or the share of... Uh, of uh, of the labor bill that need to be to borrow in advance or you know what type of deep parameter? Yeah. Yes. Um, so okay, very good. So ju just ju just one thing. So I uh, so I didn't enter into micro foundations and 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 I didn't do any you know uh, uh, normative analysis. So this is why I thought you know at least you know for the presentation that was making sense. But you're right that then we would would like to back up those gamma i and gamma y why to to some kind of deeper parameter. So. That the way we are, the model we're using, but we're not sure that that's the, the best model to use. But for the for the for the cost channel, is that um, yeah. So firms are producing um, uh, intermediate goods that are used to produce the final good, and final goods and and final good, intermediate goods and labor are entering in a Leontief way in the production of the final good, and the weight in the Leontief will directly translate into uh, the gamma R and the gamma Y. Okay, together with the uh, the share of the share of the, the bill that we need to know. Now, if you ask me, you know, so good a good thing to do we, that we haven't done is to look at you know what would be the meaning for those shares, and you know, and see if it has any connection with the real world. But you, know, uh, maybe it's not a good answer. I'm really happy that if you, if you tell me so, but I'm not sure. I want really to kind of like to to. I don't. Want, I'm not trying to convince you that. You know, the world has this kind of like super simple, you know, structure with, with the Leontief. The Leontief was the way in which it was possible to basically span all the possible value for gamma Y and gamma R. So, um, yeah. 
I so, see, I see. But, but you're right that at least we could look at you know, the implication in terms of the of the deep parameter that we can. I mean, we can do that. But that, that, that that's okay, thank you. A, a very, very very valid question. So let me just um, forward two questions from Anton uh, Nakov, uh, who apparently, you know, right now is not, not here anymore, but he asked kind of two robustness questions. So the one is about high inflation in the 70s, whether you have excluded this in your estimation. Uh, Anton, is it Anton you want to ask yourself? Um, allow him to talk. I'm, yes. I'm, we see your photo. Okay, yeah, so uh, the other one was about steady state inflation. What do you assume? Because in the 70s, there was also high inflation. And what's your steady state inflation? How important is that? Okay, so, so the, thanks for the question. So first question, so we do, so we do many things, but we always, in, okay, yeah. We, we do or not include the, you know, the great inflation period. So the baseline estimation I showed you was 69, 2017. So, uh, so that we're not cherry picking anything, but perhaps it's not a good idea. And you know, I, I believe personally that generally it's not a good idea to include like the, the disinflation, the volcanic disinflation into those estimations. So we also do that. It works also. Uh, we um, yeah. So it, it's something that, that we find you know, consistently. And and for the the steady state inflation, yeah, we, yeah, we don't do anything particularly fancy. We just assume that uh, uh, we're yeah we're just linearizing around the uh, zero inflation steady state. So that's I guess is. A, but you know, in the estimation, that's for the model. In the estimation, everything is giving, right? Um, Thanks. Yeah. Sir. Yes. But I'm happy, you know. I'm happy, sorry, I'm happy to take suggestions, you know, later on, you know, by email about, you know, how how should we do that, you know, in a proper way. I never have been convinced that um, taking seriously uh, non-zero inflation those models was making a big difference. But you know, that might be really my my. Misunderstanding of, of the literature. Okay. Also, just a quick reminder for people who are asking questions here in the chat: you can also, you know, just you know, raise your hand, and then I'll unmute you, and then you know, you can ask a question. So, Wei, for example, if you want to ask the question yourself, just raise your hand. Otherwise, I can ask it. There was also a question in the chat. So, if you want to ask that yourself, otherwise, okay, there was a you know, way. Okay, way you can unmute yourself if you like. Thanks, Ralph. Hi. Wait. Hi. Hi. Um, I would like also to take the opportunity to thank uh, the organizers of VMAG to provide such good positive externality. Um, I have a quick question, Frank, uh, about the, um, the interpretation of uh, the cost channel. Suppose we have capital investment in place. I wonder whether that will sure translate high interest rate into high inflation, because firms can cut investment and related costs so that still can push down the, the aggregate demand, right? You have other ways of cutting costs, may not just um, by putting up uh, uh, higher wage bills to pass along uh, the costs. Does that will, uh, change okay. the, yeah. So once, once we had capital, we had basically, you know, we had something on the demand side and something on the supply, on, on the, yes. on the supply side. So on the demand side, we had, we had investment and then investment may be reactive to Perhaps even more reactive to the, the interest rate than than consumption is. So you know, so you would add like a, perhaps you will strengthen the the, um, the kind of like the, the indirect demand effect. On the other side, it's still the case that you know you, firms need you know one or another to to pay for 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 the for for the services of capital, and you know this you know, the user cost of capital will be directly linked to the to 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 to, to the interest rate. So the cost channel will, will still be there, you know, even without any financial frictions, just because you would have, you know, a user cost of capital that will, you know, by, by arbitrage will be a function of the, of the interest rate. Is that answering your question? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was thinking kind of how to think about the demand and supply together when capital is there. So you have the dual role of capital, right? One can- Yes, use yes. It. Input yeah, at the collateral. So I wonder whether I think it's very interesting that uh, once we think about how to uh, uh, um, form, uh, write a model that the firms will set prices in response to higher interest rate when capital investment is also in place. So, right. So I, I, you know, I guess it boils down to again, you know, this confinement condition. So I think it, 
it's not really uh, an issue that you know there will be a cost channel if you have capital because you have just the usual cost of capital. Then the question is how responsible will be investment to the interest rate, right? In the Euler equation, basically. And you know, the higher the higher it will be, the lower will be the chance that we're in this fat man zone. But if we believe that you know for many reasons, including for example, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, constraints, you know, firms can't really react to the to, to, to the, and kind of fully react to the interest rate on their investment margin, then we will be more likely to be in that Batman, uh, Batman zone. But it's, yeah, it's okay. Um, we haven't, you know, yeah, okay. The, but then, you know, the, the theory becomes a bit like a pain, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a pain to compute uh, precisely the condition. So that's something that needs to be estimated uh, you know, more cleanly. Because, you know, another thing, you know, another critic that, 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 I'm, you know, we are making to ourselves is that, you know, the story of this, um, it's unlikely that the, you know, the, 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 the financial cost of firms is directly, uh, you know, the Fed fund rate, but it's some kind of like mar you know, wedge over the uh, markup over the Fed fund rate. And if markups are, if, if those spreads are, are, are cyclical, then, you know, things could be a bit different, but we, yeah. Thank uh, you. We, we haven't, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. So, Philippos, uh, you're allowed to uh, to talk. You just have to unmute yourself. Great. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Great. Thanks. So, a great paper, and thanks a lot for putting this together. So, two short questions. First, so since in, you know I'm thinking of uh, accommodating shocks, I wonder about the shocks. So, since inflation doesn't rise much after you lower the rates, then price dispersion does, doesn't rise. So, does that mean that uh, accommodation is more powerful? Like in the sense, there's lower inefficiency. I'm thinking of the Nakamura Steins and uh, paper here. And second, uh, well, I'm wondering whether, whether this result confirms the neo Fisherian argument that you lower, um, uh, you, you lower interest rates and you lower inflation and vice versa. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So I have to think more about the, about the, you know, the, 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 the effect that goes through dispersion in that model. So as I said, we haven't looked at all at, um, at, at, at um, worth analysis here. So I'll think about it, but I don't have any like smart answer uh, at this point. So for the second one, so if you think, so of course, in, 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 you know, in the long run, you have to be like neo Fisher, and so that's, you know, it's almost, uh, you know, that's the Fisher equation, right? So, and then, and then, you know, so what we have is a kind of, if you want, neo Fisher, like uh, uh, effect in the short run, but for reasons that are, you know, like very different from, you know, the one generally, uh, used in the literature, which are often, you know, about like uh, difficulties to separate permanent and transitory shocks. Here, it's like a very kind of like a dull and boring direct effect through the cost channel. So, you know, there's nothing like a particular, uh, particularly subtle or, you know, it's, 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 it's very direct. So it's not at all the same. I'm thinking of a paper of uh, Martin Uribe, uh, perhaps with uh, Stephanie, I'm not sure, but, you know, so those kind of papers, yeah, it's complete different mechanism, which is like, yeah, very direct, as I said. Okay, there's another hand up, uh, Alexi. Um, you're allowed to talk, please unmute yourself. Hi everyone, I uh, hope you, you can hear me. Yes, go ahead. Uh, we can, thanks. Okay, uh, that's very interesting paper, Franz. Thanks very much. Uh, and thanks to organizers for the event. My question is the following. So in your Phillips curve, you have the, K cost term um, separately from the output gap term. Now, um, I would I would think that that the the, co the K cost term should be correlated with output gap. It should be part of the output gap measure. If you take a, whatever standard Newtonian model, Smith and Barton or, or, or others, and you measure the output gap there, with this mechanism, you know, they would this, this this cost will be correlated with the output gap measure. So I'm I'm confused. Um, how do you identify, like, what is this, why you consider them separately, and how do you identify this, this K cost that you specify as being separate from the alpha gap term within the Phillips curve equation? I hope this is, this makes sense. Thanks. Yeah, 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 of course. Okay, so let, let's take the, the, no, it's a great question. Let's take the, 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 um, the Phillips curve estimation, okay? So in the Phillips curve estimation, of course, I mean, the, you know, every, you know everything is endogenous on, on both sides, right? So, 
So, okay, so when you write down the model and you write the model in terms of you know, deviations from, from the, the flex price allocations, it happens that to a first order, you have those two terms, Y and, uh, you know, in the, in marginal cost, uh, output gap, and then the real interest rate. That doesn't mean that, you know, they are, you know, that they are not correct because both are endogenous variables. So it's really like the full structure of the model that will, you know, that will, uh, that will be able to identify this gamma R and the gamma Y, whereas you know, everything is endogenous. So now, how can we, how do we identify, you know, with instruments? And then, you know, what we use as good as the instruments are, are, are considered as good. But indeed, if you look in the data, I mean, the two will be correlated, of course. And then if you look at the responses, you know, you do see that output gap and real interest rate are moving together. But then, so it's a matter of, and this is why we do this, those two exercises, um, um, the, the full, the full uh, structural model and then the one equation that are like two different ways of, of addressing the identification issue. But you know, from a theory perspective, up to a first order, the two terms enter separately, but both are endogenous. So yes, they will be correlated. And then, you know, the, you know this, this equation has no particular meaning. The only thing that matters is the solution of this you know, set of three equations. We have, we have done. And uh, yeah, so, but yes, they are correlated. And that's exactly why, you know, identification is, 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 uh, is, is, is not trivial and results are always uh, just, you know, or what they are. I mean, they are under, Thanks. yeah, yes. Just a quick follow up. This this idea would be very easy to check if on the simulated data using best and bottles or whatever model, right? Where you know exactly what 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 these terms are, and just to see if your method uh, holds water. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. No, but okay. I mean, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. I see, I see what you mean. But I mean, it's yeah, okay. It should matter. You're right. You're right. You're right. No, no, it's a good point. It's a good point. That's a very good point. Great. So do we have any more questions? So I don't see any hands raised anymore. But given that we are basically out of time and we had tons of discussion, I would suggest we move on to the uh, breakout room to have a more informal discussion. So I posted the link in the chat and I'll just post it again because it was like, you know, like at the top here. So everybody can go to that breakout room that I will open up. Oh, that was the wrong one. It was for Anton. So where's my... Zoom link. No, here we go. That's the Zoom link, so I'll just go there and open it. And um, yeah, thank you very much for joining today. It was a great presentation, great discussion at the end. And then we'll resume in March. We will um, send around an email and asking for submissions at some point. Uh, but you know, first, happy holidays. And yeah, thanks for coming today. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, everyone.